version of our emotional resilience presentation. Um, I have to tell you, it's really been it's been a journey to get here to make this recording for you. Our our event last night was wonderful, and thank you so much to each of you who attended. And the recording didn't work. And so then I started earlier today to record this again, and I got about halfway through, and then my power went out, and I lost that recording as well. So this is take three, and I want to really just begin um, with gratitude that you're here and that we can make this happen even after all of this interference, and also with an intention that now after all of this effort and everything that I have um, been working with and a lot of frustration that I've been feeling, um, I want to really hold the intention that I can let all of that go and set all of that aside and that whatever needs to flow through me to serve you in the best way possible, that that will be able to happen. <sighs> so meanwhile, I would like to invite you to set an intention for yourself for this time. So we know we're not on a live call, um, interactive with each other, and that can be a lot of temptation to uh, multitask or to try to knock out a couple emails while you're listening. And you know, no judgment. If that's all that you can do, then okay. But if it's possible for you to carve out some sacred time, I would really love to encourage you to do that and to really set the intention now of. You know, what is it that you most need to receive when it comes to your emotional life and emotional wellness? Is there something that is tough that you're struggling with? Are you working on a really big mission in the world that requires a greater emotional capacity so that you can really be of full service? Are you working with painful history? and you want to be able to move through that, <laughs> excuse me, um, with grace, whatever it is, let's take a moment to breathe that in. And we are going to move immediately from your intention and from what you're bringing into our very first tool. There are going to be three tools that I teach tonight, along with six characteristics of highly resilient people um, that come directly from the research. And I'm also going to tell you a little bit about my own personal story and why um, this work matters so much in the world. And I'm also going to share about how you can continue this work. Um, of course, all of these tools that we use tonight I want you to take and slip them into your back pocket and take them with you. And they're free for you just to use and to share um, and hopefully to receive a lot of benefit from. But I also know that there's just so much more than I can possibly give in one single evening. And I want to make sure that if it calls to you and if you are ready to step into greater resilience, that I tell you exactly how you can uh, work with me to do that. So I'll be sharing that as well. well let's go ahead and um, start with our first tool. So just holding with you um, whatever it is that you would like to work on a little bit tonight. And I want to ask you not to choose something that is you know, intensely painful or challenging. Um, just because you're on your own right now and we don't even have a chat you know, to support you. So I want you to choose something that is going to feel well within your ability to work with on your own. Um, working on things that are you know, like a 10 out of 10 in terms of trauma and pain and stress, that's really something that is much better to do with tools that are well practiced and with the support of a professional. So, um, choose something that's present for you, but that you feel able to handle and to work with. And once you have that issue, that challenge, doesn't have to be the ultimate one, but just something to work with for tonight, we're going to move to our first tool for building emotional resilience. 
And this tool is to observe your body sensations. So let's do it first, and then we'll talk about it and debrief it a little. So I want you to bring that, that subject, that uh, thing into your awareness. And rather than like think about it in your head a whole lot, just sort of bring it to mind with an image or a memory or um, a thought. And then I want you to let your awareness drop out of your head and into your body. So it's like you're, it's almost like you're pulling up a screen, you know, on the computer, pulling up an image or pulling up this issue. And then instead of staying mentally with the issue, you're going to notice what happens to your body as you are present with that, that challenge. So when we were on the call live last night, um, and I asked people to, to do this, just check in, really feeling in your belly, in your chest, in your throat, and also into your face. What is it that you feel? What are the sensations that you feel? You got a, a lot of really good answers. Maybe throat, like someone shared last night. Maybe there's tightness in your chest or a feeling of butterflies in your stomach. There are no right or wrong answers, but we are generally looking for feelings that are happening um, in the torso and in the face. Just notice what you feel. We can do this for feelings that are pleasant or unpleasant. All that we're doing is bringing our attention to them. And as you turn your attention to these sensations, I want you to just notice that even if they're uncomfortable, you're still okay. You're still breathing. You're still here. And when you're ready, we only need a quick dip of practice. We don't have to stay here or linger too long. I want you to just say um, out loud if possible, just say thank you. So if you're saying thank you to your body for communicating to you. And then exhale it out. <sighs> Let's talk a little bit about this tool and why this is so great and so important for building our resilience. So we have a really common tendency as human animals to um, try to avoid the things that make us feel uncomfortable. And it's also true that discomfort tends to be present at the edges where we are growing, where we're being asked to grow and to get bigger um, and to get healthier, to get stronger. So, we can really start to push away or avoid um, thinking about, but especially feeling about whatever it is that we are most needing to address and work on in order to help um, our lives or our health become better. And the importance of this tool of observing the body sensations is to really learn to befriend the kinds of feelings that come up in the body when we feel anxious or scared or uncomfortable or challenged in some way. And this will not only help to hone your intuition because you're going to get more familiar with what these sensations are. You're going to be able to interpret them. You're going to be able to listen to your body's wisdom that much more clearly. It's also going to short circuit that, that avoidance tendency. And what avoidance tends to do is to create a split in us where we are in one way trying to push away or avoid the issue or the feelings. And then simultaneously, we're trying to control um, that situation. So it's like that's when you get on that loop in your head and the thoughts just keep going and going and going, but they're not really taking you anywhere or solving the problem. That's usually part of an obsession, um, obsessive loop that is usually coupled with um, avoidance and pushing away. So the answer 
is really to build this muscle of being able to simply breathe and feel what it is that you're feeling in the given moment. So um, this is a type of mindfulness practice. So um, there's an abundance of research about all forms of mindfulness, um, this one included. And this is one of the tools that I love, um, but I particularly chose it to start out tonight because from my own journey, this practice has been hugely transformative. So many of you know that I'm a clinical herbalist and um, that I have been doing this work around mental health and women's health for quite a number of years now. Um, but I know that there are a lot of you who are also are, are new to this community. And so I want to tell you a little bit more of my story more personally. Um, I remember very clearly when I first got to college, I studied to be an actress. I didn't necessarily choose, um, you know, healing arts as my calling. It sort of chose me. Um, thought I was going to be an actress. And I got to acting school and I remember telling some of my teachers, my movement teachers, that it felt like I didn't, I couldn't feel anything really from the neck down. I mean, not like I was paralyzed or something, but metaphorically, like I wasn't in touch with what my body was telling me. And I had spent so much time um, pushing down all kinds of uncomfortable emotions and trauma history and challenges and all this kind of stuff um, that I really believe that this contributed greatly to some serious physical illnesses that I had early in life that were a big part of leading me toward this kind of work that I do now. Um, and I was able to, through a number of different means, you know, natural, spiritual, and conventional, all of those came into play um, to recover from a couple of really serious illnesses all before I was 25. Um, but the piece that remained kind of unfinished was this piece of um, really making a full recovery of my emotional resilience, my emotional wellness. So um, I'll share a little bit more about that later. But this specific tool of observing the body sensations, this is a way that we actually lift the burden of um, emotion and stress out of the physical body so that it doesn't have to turn into a symptom. Like to say, if we can listen to the sensation, then we don't necessarily have to have the symptom. Doesn't mean that all illnesses are this way, but certainly some physical symptoms that we have are the body's way of trying to speak or communicate with us. Since the body doesn't speak um, spoken language, the body has to communicate in this other way. So this is going to help tremendously your physical and your emotional resilience, this first tool. OK, so let's move to our first characteristic of emotionally resilient people. Temporary distress and dysfunction. I, I love this one so much, um, partly because it's the piece that I was talking about in the um, the intro for this workshop of, you know, sometimes it's really good to just chill on the couch with a tub of coconut ice cream and watch, you know, Netflix for a couple of days. Um, that's what this is referring to. And the research is very clear that people who um, do not allow themselves to feel their feelings and to experience distress and sadness or fear or whatever it is, um, in the moment when they need to, um, these people go on to have um, the most serious physical and mental health um, problems as a cohort after a significant stressful event in life. The people who do well, um, they tend to really experience um, some amount of disruption and dysfunction and distress um, in response to a major um, painful event or a stressor or a trauma. So I don't know about you, but I was really sort of subtly trained to be more like the people that the researchers label uh, resistant people. 
And those are the people who kind of they buck up and they have a stiff upper lip and they don't let them see you sweat and all that kind of thing. They just keep going. And that is highly, highly correlated with um, stress-related illness, heart disease, cancer, um, mental health problems, all kinds of stuff. So um, there are whole communities of people who have also been trained to be this way, that it's not safe to fall apart or that's just not what we do. Um, and this is really coming uh, to the forefront as something that we need to start to transform within the culture as well. So this is my call that let's all just see if we can step forward with a little bit more of our truth, the truth of how we feel and the truth of who we are, because truly um, this distress and this dysfunction that comes up, this is the leveling ground that makes the compost that will allow a beautiful flower, a beautiful fruiting tree to sprout up out of, the, out of the pain and suffering that we experience. So just a word here about um, the importance of looking at this from the perspective of building resilience and why we're focusing on that instead of trying to just reduce the effects of the stress. You know, when instead of thinking about, okay, temporary distress and dysfunction, let's bring in some stress relief for these people. Of course, that can be important to do. But I think that if we focus only on relieving stress, we're missing a really big piece of the puzzle, which is that human life is inherently stressful condition. If we're living um, in touch with our hearts and in touch with what's happening in the world around us. So if you want to love, if you want to create from the deepest place of who you are, if you want to stand up for what's right in the world, even when that's unpopular, if you want to be a force to um, stem the tide of environmental destruction, of systemic oppressions of all kinds, if you want to stand up for what you believe, if you want to help be a force to mend the, the, the pain and the brokenness that's here on the planet, then you've got to be ready for some stress because there's no way, there's no way even to love, you know, even like bar all of that amazing uh, kind of transformative work that I know all of you are engaged in in your own personal way. There's no way to even just love somebody or follow your dreams or have a family or have friends without experiencing significant stress and loss, it's just the human condition. So I think that by building our resilience, what we actually do is we make it more possible to live the life that was meant for each of us. That if you become more resilient, you have the, um, you have the bandwidth and you have the room to take some risks and to love and to create and to stand up. So that's, that's why we're not just trying to calm you down or relieve your stress. I think that um, I think that the world actually needs a lot more people who care and who are willing to um, engage rather than just sort of step back and bliss out. Okay, tool number two. So let's return to that awareness of um, the issue that you brought at the beginning of the call. And let's try a second tool working with it. So I want you to um, just bring in that awareness of the issue. Just notice how you feel. And maybe give yourself a number from 1 to 10, just to say how stressful does this feel on a scale of 1 to 10. And we're going to just begin. We just kind of let that go once you've felt it. And start just by bringing focus to the area around your heart. And so I like to place my hands here myself. I'm just feeling into the space around your heart. 
And then beginning to bring in some breathing. Just breathing right into your heart. So you have heart focus, heart breathing. Now we're going to bring in a heartfelt feeling of appreciation. So I want you to think of something, not a person, could be an animal, could be nature, could be your bed, food, something that you really appreciate. And a vivid image or sensory impression of that thing. And then start to breathe that into your heart. So we still have the heart focus and the heart breathing. And we're bringing in this feeling of appreciation. And just keep going. And so what this is doing is there's a lot of scientific research to back this practice up. It comes from the Institute of Heart Math. I highly recommend them. You can check into them if you'd like. This practice helps to bring your heart rate into a state of greater heart rate variability. And basically what this means is that your nervous system is shifting into a mode in which it can be restored, um, in which your body can heal itself in which you can experience um, the emotions of bonding and connection. And um, this is very conducive to recovery and healing, both emotionally and physically. So whenever you're ready, just gently letting that go. And just notice if you feel any different now than you did before you started. And this is a lot um, more powerful when we're all together live, but just recall some of the things that people said last night. I remember people saying that they felt warm, that they felt much more relaxed, um, and just expressing a lot of relief. There was one person who said, you know, I didn't really feel much of a shift. I, I really couldn't stop thinking about the issue about that's on my mind. And if that was the case for you, then I would suggest that when you're learning this tool or any of these tools, try to learn or start with something that's a little bit less intense. If you're not able to let go of the thing, then you're probably in a place where you actually need a different kind of support or tool. You might need some human contact um, and you might need a tool that you already know rather than something that you're learning that's brand new. So we also had a question come up about um, somebody feeling kind of numb and shut down. And we talked a little bit about the freeze response and wove that in at the end of the of the call. Um, so if I can with my time, I will I'll do that here tonight as well. So as we talk about this next characteristic of resilient people, I, um, I'm going to tell you another little chapter of my story. Um, so making meaning is a wonderful characteristic of resilient people that I really um, am drawn to because um, it connects to everything um, spiritual. You know, this is this is the place where people who have spiritual or religious practice tend to have um, strengthened emotional resilience due to those practices. Um, and yet you don't have to be religious in order to, um, or spiritual in order to use this principle. This simply means that, you know, as humans, what we do best is we create stories and we um, create meaning from things. And when we're able to do this out of the most challenging circumstances in our life or something that we're up against, um, it gives us a great deal of strength and makes it possible to bear things that we otherwise um, could not. And this is most beautifully expressed in um, the psychologist Viktor Frankl's work. And 
his book, Man's Search for Meaning, I highly recommend, in which he talks about his experience in a concentration camp um, during World War II and his ability to survive and how connected it was to his ability to somehow, in completely senseless, um, dehumanizing circumstances, to connect to some greater sense of meaning um, for his life. Um, truly profound work. So in my own story, a big part of the way that making meaning has shown up is that some of the most difficult and dark chapters of my life have now become the, um, the fodder and the means by which I can empathize with others and I can actually serve people who are facing similar circumstances. And what it has required is it has required me to be a little bit brave about telling you um, some things that I probably wouldn't tell you if we just met, you know, in the street or we just met for coffee. Um, so I'm asking you to hold me with compassion here. So even though for many years as I began my herbal practice, I, I talked pretty freely about the physical illnesses that I had that I had suffered with, I really left a big piece of the puzzle out. And it has to do with the stigma that still is attached to um, emotional and mental health problems in our culture. And I really thought, if I tell if I tell them this, like I'm going to be ruined, <laughs> you know? Like, who would ever trust me if they if they knew about this part of my past? Um, and what I'm finding is, well, I don't know. I guess we'll find out more after today. But what I've been finding so far is that actually a lot of people feel relieved to know that they're not alone. So if this serves you in that way. Then I'm really glad. It makes meaning for me. So, you know, I grew up in a in a really nice home, um, the middle class to upper middle class upbringing. Um, my parents love each other. They are still happily married. I have a great little sister. I got to do activities and I did well in school, all blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, and yet, um, starting in fifth grade, I started to have um, very, very strong so suicidal feelings and really wanting to end my life in, in fifth grade. And these um, challenges, this really dark and um, serious depression, um, eating disorder issues, um, anxiety issues, all of this stuff continued on um, until I was 21, 22. And for that whole span of time, um, I was really running that like resistance program, you know, of like trying not to fall into the distress and dysfunction. I was really like, I would kind of try to pull it all together so that I could keep on achieving, keep on, you know, starring in the theater productions and doing well in school and all of that kind of thing. And Finally, after many years, you know, I got into my dream college. I was pursuing what it was that I most wanted in the world. Living in New York City, I mean, everything that I could dream. I had a boyfriend who I was really into, and um, you know, things were seemingly good. But this this incredible pain inside just wouldn't go away. And I finally, in fact, I think it might. We're, we're at like a real anniversary because this happened in July, um, early July, um, about 10 years ago. Um, I decided like, okay, this is really it. I'm really going to, I'm really going to kill myself this time. And fortunately, I was not successful despite my, my best effort. But I had a moment when I came through that. I was, I was hospitalized then uh, in the psych ward against my will. Because um, when you try to kill yourself, you don't get to then say, like, no, I don't really need to be here. No one, <laughs> no one listens to you. Um, I, I remember having a moment when I decided, you know, I didn't die, but something, something has to be sacrificed here. You know, something has to die and never come back. And I don't want this to in any way seem to minimize. Um, 
mental health or mental illness because they don't think it's as simple as a decision. Um, there was a lot that was involved in my healing. But I really know that I made a decision to let that, that pathway, that thought of like, I'm going to just take my own life and check out of here. I made a decision to, um, to interpret my lack of success in killing myself when I was so determined. And like, I'm an achiever. Like, I usually succeed at things that I try. Um, I took, I made meaning of that and decided to interpret it in such a way that said, no, that's not going to be your path. That is not an option anymore to do something else. And then what unfolded over the course of the next 10 years and brought us up to present day is everything from, um, you know, getting out of the hospital and immediately applying for a fellowship in India where I worked on the mystical poetry of Rumi and uh, made theater with people from all around the world and just really opened my heart. And, you know, having some really good psychotherapy, which I highly recommend, um, and, and ultimately discovering the plants, discovering herbal medicine and discovering um, real nutrition and discovering um, community and interdependence and discovering this body of work around emotional resilience and realizing that the thing that I had felt all along, which was that, you know, this isn't like, I don't think that it's just like I need to take a pill or something like my soul is hurting. My soul hurts and nobody can talk to me about that. Nobody will touch that. Um, I really came to find that the kinds of of medicine, you know, which in traditional cultures, the word medicine just means power. It doesn't mean a pill that you get from the pharmacy. But that the kinds of medicine that were available really would speak to my soul. And that my soul really did want to tell me something. I really did need to grow and get bigger. I really did need to um, develop the strength to bear some of these emotions and sensations that I had been trying and trying to push away and that kept rearing up and then trying to, you know, whisper in my ear and tell me to hurt myself. So all of this is to say that however dark or hard it might be right now, um, you're not alone. And there is hope. And if you have an inkling of a feeling like um, you need some support or some, somebody who sees your reality um, that includes something more sacred and more full and more complete than just the idea that you, your brain chemistry is off and that that might be part of it, but that's not the whole story. You're not crazy and you're not alone and you're in the right place. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that um, I don't think it, I don't think it's ever done. You know, I don't think I'm, I'm not finished on my, you know, my work. I'm not like healed and like I'm an actor story or something. Like it doesn't work like that, I don't think, in real life. Um, but what I can say is that now I'm, I'm, I'm free to really work on the things that I'm being called to work on now and in present time. And I'm, the challenges and the problems I'm having have to do with how I'm trying to grow and the contribution that I want to make. And I know that that's possible for all of us if we have the right support. So this is an encouragement that whatever it is that you're struggling with, let's um, create something meaningful out of it. Um, how can you see your struggle through the eyes of the divine? Or imagine like you're seeing through the eyes of your, your own soul um, speaking to you about what the curriculum is that you're here to take on planet Earth as a, as a spiritual being having a human experience. And maybe there's something that you can, that you can learn so that you can um, have a little bit more strength to keep going. Okay, so this is, oh, that picture is very grainy. Um, this is the next characteristic of resilient people. 
And this is my little sister, who is also my best friend. Um, and this is interdependence. And we're, we're simulating interdependence tonight because we're not here together live. Um, but this is the principle that says that a web that is woven of many different threads and um, brought together, um, you know, like, uh, not a web maybe, but a tapestry, you know, um, is stronger than a single thread by itself. Or the idea that um, an ecosystem that has lots and lots of species rather than a monoculture, you know, just like a field of corn, like genetically modified corn, <laughs> like um, versus a field of um, lots and lots of different kinds of wildflowers and fruits and vegetables and animals and all kinds of, of things in, interconnected. Um, those kinds of systems, both human and environmental, that are um, diverse and interdependent will always be stronger and will always do better. So this is a place where we need to be willing to admit when we need help and we need to be generous of connecting and giving our help and support to others. And we can practice interdependence with other people, but we can also practice interdependence in other ways, like simply by recognizing, um, I really recognized it today, like my electricity went out and normally I take that for granted, you know, that I can just flip a switch and a light will come on. But really, I'm dependent on a lot of other people and systems and um, fuel that keeps these things going. So if we can look at how we are dependent, um, interdependent, we'll start to see the way that we're participating in the systems um, that are part of our lives, make better decisions about those systems, and help to strengthen them so that um, we all can do better. Um, not to mention, get the support that so many of us are really starving for. Um, because I know that a lot of you are not asking for help when you need it. I know that for a fact. So if that rings true, um, that's your first piece of homework from this webinar, is to get off of this call and ask someone for help. Ask someone to listen to your story. Um, send me an email. I'm happy to, <laughs> I'm happy to be that person. Um, but really, it's it's time. It's time. None of us can do this on our own. And we got to admit it and ask for the help that we need. OK, so now I have a provocative question for you. Are you ready? OK. So I want you to take a moment right now and to allow yourself to dream a little bit. Think about the scope of your emotional life, your emotional resilience as it is now. And I want you to ask yourself, ask your heart, what would feel like a miracle when it comes to my emotional wellness? And just how I feel day to day. What would feel like a miracle? I'm asking this as a person who very much feels like, um, who knows actually that, that I am here as a result of a lot of miracles. And that that girl, that suffering girl that I was, um, could not have imagined what it feels like for me now when I get up in the morning and go to yoga and like hang out with my dog and and do this work with you. That person that I used to be could only have had the faintest inkling of this. And yet what I'm asking for you to do is to help accelerate the process a little so maybe you don't have to wait 10 years. And to invite in just the tiniest bit of what that miracle might be. And then since we don't have a chat here tonight, I want you to tell that miracle to at least one other person. Again, happy for it to be me, melanie at psycheandsoma.com. Just send me an email. Tell me your miracle. I would love to hear it. 
um, find me on Facebook. I would love to hear it. Um, it's really important to let yourself dream like this. Okay. And while you're doing that, I, I think I still have my prop here. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, no, you guys. Um, all right, so I have, I have these um, amber glasses that I wear for sleep, but this is the, the sleep piece that I was going to tell you about. Um, and I was going to show them to you right now, but I'm going to have to do that later because I don't have them. I put them away, I guess. Um, I'm sorry, I've interrupted our whole miracle flow here by having that bit with the glasses. Okay, so I want you to really hold on to this vision of your miracle. And as you're holding this, um, thinking about where you are now and thinking about what that miracle would be, um, I want to just share with you about the program that I run called Nimble Heart Unwavering Soul. And I want to really invite you um, from just the purest place of truth that is in me that if you're ready to have some support in order to bring this miracle about a little easier and a little faster because you don't have to do it alone, um, I would love to walk with you on that journey. And we have a beautiful community of women who are ready to walk with you um, if you would like to join us. So Nimble Heart. Um, just so much good for me to say about about this group and about this program. This um, program has been running now for a year. This is the one year anniversary and this is our third session. And we've really built very clear data now over this past year that um, doing the program gives people a pretty strong immediate benefit in terms of um, immediate tools that they can use that reduce the symptoms of stress relieve that burden on their bodies and their minds. Um, but then also, as time goes on, and now we have a little bit more you know, longevity, what I'm seeing is that this is really becoming a practice for people that um, doesn't feel like it's a class that you take and then it's just over and you learn information and you sit it aside. It's really something that is weaving into people's everyday lives. and. Uh, for that, for me, I'm, I'm just so grateful. Um, and when we talk about, about taking a journey from where you are um, a little closer to that miracle, I don't know what it is, so I can't tell you for sure if I can help you specifically with it or not, though if you want to talk to me about it, we can. Um, but to, to remove some of those obstacles so we can get closer to that miracle, um, this is how we do it in Nimble Heart. First of all, the way that we learn is that we are in community with one another. So we have this fabulous platform where we can all be together and participate on the chat and come live voice to voice. Um, I do a lot of um, coaching and individual feedback throughout the program. So even though it is not one on one, um, you do get a good bit of personal attention from me, both um, on the calls and also in the Facebook group. So it's a really affordable way to get some one-on-one -on -one type attention with a much lower price tag. And this community connection allows us to practice that interdependence principle. That's so important. Secondly, um, the way that we, that we structure the program is about not just giving you tools, but giving you the deeper understanding of why those tools will work so that you can keep adjusting and using them as your needs change throughout your life. So in week number one, which will be next Tuesday, July the 7th, um, we'll be starting. In week number one, we're gonna unpack and understand what exactly your stress response is and why it goes beyond what we've all been taught about just fight or flight, that's part of it, yes, but there's also this whole other um, thing that happens that 
is way under talked about that's called the freeze response. Um, teach something called the polyvagal theory, um, which is the, the current understanding of how our nervous system works. And basically what this unlocks for us in week one is to be able to understand when you're shut down in certain ways and you, you know that you have support or you know that you have tools but you can't seem to access them, this is going to tell you why. And you'll have a greater degree of self-compassion because it's just, you know, it's just natural. This is just how our bodies work. And I'm going to give you specific strategies for each of those kinds of states that your brain and your nervous system can be in so that you can meet yourself where you are and, and come back to center more quickly. So that's week one. Um, this huge, like, you know, fireworks of, um, of insight that kind of come right off the bat. And then that information helps us to structure the following weeks. So in week number two, we talk about healing foods and lifestyle practices. So instead of just saying, oh, you need to eat, you know, B vitamins for stress, which is true, um, we understand how do these nutritional um, strategies relate to the anatomy and to the way that your nervous system and your neurotransmitters work. So again, you're getting the why in addition to the what. Um, and I'm really, you know, I'm really big on um, being emotionally healthy and practicing emotional resilience with our relationship to food. So this is very flexible and very much like what are the things that we want to add in to support ourselves, not so much about like what are all the evil things in your diet that you need to eliminate. Um, there can be a place for that, but um, that's, that's not the angle that I like to come from at first. I think that when we're depleted, we actually need to be nourished more rather than having things taken away from us. We just need to be built up first. And then some of those unhealthy things will drop away more naturally. So that's week two. And then in week three, we get to the herbs and the way that herbal medicine can support um, all of these different aspects of our emotional wellness. So we'll learn rescue type remedies, which I don't mean the the branded thing called rescue remedy. Um, I mean things that you take in the moment when you're feeling a lot of anxiety or anger or stress and you just need something now to help you because again there's a brain chemistry piece or there's a bio piece that like you can't even really get to your healthy thoughts because um, there's an obstacle of how you're feeling. Um, we learn about how to use herbs in that situation. We also learn about how to use herbs for their really incredible um, capacity to actually build our physical and emotional resilience just all on their own. Even if you're not doing any strategies, you just take these herbs and it helps, which sounds unbelievable, but um, we have now like 30 or 40 years of research on this subject. And these plants are called adaptogens, or sometimes tonics. And even though they're generally very safe and you could probably go and you know read some articles online and you know find one and try it um, and be okay the way to get the best results from any herbal regimen is to understand how to personalize it and choose the thing that's right for you and that is what we will do in this class you will be able to kind of cut through some of that noise around you know the herbs and supplements and just the confusion of the the supplement aisle in the health food store um, and go straight for the thing that's going to be most helpful for you. And then week four um, is a little bit of a sort of a grab bag week. Um, I like to work with story medicine a little bit in week four, which goes deeper into that principle of making meaning. But I also like week four to be a time when we can really just focus on some of the individual coaching and questions, which will be going on throughout the entire time, but to make sure that when you are ready to graduate in that fourth week, that you really have what you need and you're ready um, to continue on on your journey. So that's the program. And you know, on, our, on our webinar, I had actually a, um, 
a student or participant come forward and speak about her experience, um, I'm sorry that I can't share that with you, but I hope that you'll take the time to read the, the words that the um, previous participants have shared um, on the, the description page for the program. Um, I really hope that you'll take a little bit of time to hear um, what their experiences have been. And, you know, the, I think the last thing I'll say is that, you know, um, this is going to be the last time that I offer Nimble Heart in this particular format. So the reason for that is that um, I really love doing all of the individual coaching. And um, I'm reaching a point in just the capacity of my business and the number of clients that I have that I'm not going to be able to continue doing that um, at this uh, at, at this particular tuition rate. Um, but even though I know that that's true, I knew I had to offer the program at least one more time um, at this price so that everybody who's been putting it off or has been thinking like, well, maybe I'll do it next time when she runs it again, that everybody has a chance to come in and be part of the circle um, before things change. So I really want to say, if you're thinking about it at all, um, just join us and give it a try. I give you my personal, just heartfelt promise and guarantee that um, if you are with us for the first 14 days and you really give it a heartfelt try and you come to the calls and you're participating in the Facebook group, but then you realize like, whoa, this is not right for me. Um, or, oh, I really needed another kind of help, you know, um, I will happily refund your tuition and send you love and blessings and give you a referral <laughs> if you need um, to make sure that you get the help that you need. That is what's most important to me. And I also believe strongly because I have seen it um, and because this is the program that I wish existed when I was going through all of my stuff. Um, I know that, that this can help a lot of you. And I want you to take the chance and um, join us. So that's all I'm gonna say. If it's in your heart, um, if it's in your heart, just follow that. Your heart will not steer you wrong, one way or the other. Okay. All right, so we have a couple more pieces to cover. Let's see how we can, how we go, okay. So um, these are the three other characteristics that I really do like, but that are not maybe my most, most favorite that got their own slide. So the three other characteristics of um, emotionally resilient people. Number one, adaptability. So the way I think about this, and this is a weak one for me that I'm working on, is the ability to have a goal in mind and to be flexible about how you get there. So instead of being really attached to the specific steps along the way or the particular path of how you arrive, that there is a great deal of movement and flexibility that can happen even as your heart is really tuned into that North Star of your desire, or of your, your truth, okay? Um, it doesn't mean being uh, spineless. It means, um, it means actually having such a strong anchor that you're able to move and shift as needed. Heart rate variability is the second piece. This is great because it's a really objective measure. You can actually wear a heart monitor that will tell you what your heart rate variability is, and that will give you a window directly into how your nervous system is operating and how resilient you are, both physically and emotionally. These things actually, they map very closely. So, one of the things that's great about this is that um, it's concrete, it's measurable, and there are clear things that we can do to help to improve it. So this is where um, some lifestyle things come in, like you know, physical activity that's appropriate and safe and enjoyable, um, and also relaxation techniques come in here, um, and just taking good care of yourself with good sleep and rest. And so that was my, my trick for 
um, for awesome sleep is to use amber colored glasses um, when you are um, when you are kind of hanging out and it's not quite bedtime but you got the computer on and the phone might ring and glow at you um, you're watching TV you can buy um, they are they're like um, eye guard glasses I guess people who work with bright lights um, and they're protection they give you protection um, but they also block out the blue spectrum of light which has a way of disrupting your pineal gland um, and then it disrupts your circadian rhythm so that's all kind of um, fancy speak, but really what it means is that um, when that blue light is coming in, it's disrupting this, um, almost like this master start point of your hormones um, that fluctuate in a predictable rhythm throughout the day. And this can cause sleep problems, it can cause um, hormonal problems of other kinds, it can cause metabolic issues, um, fertility issues. I mean, it's just amazing the, um, the how far this goes. So I would highly recommend if you do any amount of computer or TV or phone at night, um, you want to get good rest and support that heart rate variability, get a pair of amber glasses. Um, one of my clients who was on the webinar the other night said that I looked like Bono when I was wearing them. <laughs> so um, you can imagine me with like, you know, these Bono glasses. Um, and you get the picture. Okay, last one. Internal locus of control. So this means being clear about what it is that is in your control and what is not. Very often, the things that we think are in our control are not. We cannot control other people's feelings. We cannot control um, how the bus schedule runs. I cannot control whether my electricity works. I cannot control whether the recording will work which is a scary thought right at this moment because I really might have to do this all again. <laughs> but it's not in my control. What is in my control is my response, my choice, my decision to love you guys and love myself and this work enough to keep showing up even if I have to make this recording again. Um, internal locus of control I think is beautifully summarized by the serenity prayer that comes from the recovery community. Of God grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change, to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I think I got that wrong. Courage to change the things I can, I think. Anyway, that's the basic idea. And these six characteristics are sprinkled all throughout Nimble Heart, and we will revisit them um, starting next week and go a little bit deeper to the biology and to the strategies. Okay, here we are, our last tool. And we finally get to bring the plants in a little bit. And this tool for building emotional resilience is about using your senses. This is really powerful, even if all that you do is get grounded in the here and now, and sense what is actually around you using touch, sight, and sound. Our minds tend to take us away into scenarios projecting into the future or pulling us into the past. So coming fully into the present moment using the body and the senses to ground yourself will help to dispel a lot of that fear and a lot of that tension. I think there's even more like secret sauce that we can sprinkle here if we start to bring in um, the sense of smell. Because your sense of smell um, goes directly to the part of your brain called the limbic system, which has a job of scanning for things to be afraid of or worried about in the environment, to have a fear or anger response. It contains other emotions too, but it's not looking out for opportunities to feel happy, unless you train it that way. Um, and even then, it's going to keep defaulting to uh, emergency if it's activated enough. If we bring in the sense of smell, we can not only choose plants that have properties that are extremely relaxing and soothing for the nervous system, like 
lavender, for example. But the very act of smelling something itself is, is giving an input to the exact part of the brain that is kind of firing off a little haywire. So I would like you to play with this tool of really using your senses, not just to feel inside your body like we did in the very first tool that we talked about tonight, but also to get grounded in the present moment and to be here with what's around you in the outer world. So it's an inner and outer sensing that you can do. And if you want to really sprinkle some more juice on this, um, have a beautiful aromatic plant to smell. Um, rose is wonderful for the heart. Um, rosemary or peppermint for a more energizing, sort of uplifting feeling. Um, lavender or neroli to soothe the nervous system and the mind. And I know that essential oils are all the rage right now. Um, and I would just share that I really recommend um, Snow Lotus, snowlotus.org, um, and also Appalachian Valley Natural Products um, for sources of essential oils. Um, that's all I'll say about that. I have no financial connection to either of those companies or to any herb um, supplying companies. Um, it can be a concern when, you know, all of the awareness about essential oils is great, but it can be a concern when um, there are a lot of people pushing and marketing something very, very heavily. Um, and so I just would, would urge you to be cautious. And those are two companies that I really like that I think are great to work with. So let's go ahead and take a moment um, to close. This is where we would have had some time for Q&A if we were all together live. And I want to just invite you um, truly from my heart and with some open time in my schedule intentionally for this. I really want to invite you to reach out and to connect with me directly if there are any questions that are brewing for you, whether they're more general questions, um, just about any of the content that we've covered tonight, or if there are more specific questions about um, what you're going through right now and what role herbal medicine um, might be able to play or not in helping to support you move. Um, from the struggle that you're experiencing toward something a little bit closer to your miracle. You can email me at melanie, which is M-E-L-A-N-I-E, at psycheandsoma.com. That's P-S, yes, P-S-Y-C-H-E-A-N-D, S-O-M-A dot com. Sorry, that was hard to spell for a moment. <laughs> and um, you can also reach out to me on Facebook. I'd be happy to hear from you on my um, public page or if you would like to send me a personal friend request and connect that way. I'm also very happy to do that. Um, just Melanie St. Ors, S-T dot O-U-R-S. That's me. So let's take a couple of moments to, um, to close. And I'm closing this recording with the dear, dear hope that it will work and that I will not need to do this again. Um, and also with the hope that this will reach the hearts and the minds of everyone who is meant to receive it and that people will share it if they know someone who needs this information and that everybody who um, has an inkling of needing some support or some help will reach out tonight to somebody, whether it's me or a friend or another professional or a religious leader or um, a dog, <laughs> um, that, that this will be a time when we can all start to lean on each other and show up as the most true versions of ourselves and get the support and the help and the love that we each need and deserve so richly. 
And with that, I wish you a beautiful night or day. And I very much hope that if you um, are thinking about Nimble Heart, that you'll join us. Oh, I almost forgot. And um, if you join us before Friday, I'm offering 20 minute private sessions um, to either the first 10 people who join or everyone who joins um, before Friday. So I'm giving you a little bit of time to listen to this recording um, so that you can make your decision. So if you're thinking about it, um, do it now. I'd love to be able to work with you a little bit one-on-one, -on -one, sprinkle some extra love um, into the sauce. All right, my darlings. <sighs> Have a beautiful, beautiful day or night, and I look forward to talking to you really soon.